books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Remember, the, we do this so that you'll say it. When you say it, it goes out of your mouth and into your ear, and somehow it works into your brain, and you, you memorize it that way. So it really works. So uh, just saying it, so, uh, so you have to turn to the front of the Bible and Read it, that's, that's fine. Just do it over and over again. And you'll have it. And you know those tabs in the Bibles, I find out after a while that those tabs just slow you down. If you know, if you know your Bible, the tabs will slow you down because you're, you're, you're trying to work with them and, and when you just turn straight to the, to the book, it works a lot better. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. I need to have these copied. Okay, and do uh, let's see. Uh, it's about fifteen actually. <coughs> we got all turned around here. We're putting chairs back down now so it's cleaning the carpet and stuff, so I forgot to have that copied off. So there's blank places. You get to fill in the blanks. Okay. So let's turn to John chapter 8. You know where that's at, right? Just after 7. John chapter 8. I'm going to read it out loud here. Verses 11 through 16. God's word says, And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. Excuse me, that was 16. That's good. That's the last one. But we don't need to read that one then. Okay. It's uh, 11. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I Bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. <coughs> so we're on external security number six. I have a little bit of a review here, and then we'll go on into it. Uh, since it's so important, we need to do this review on what we've covered. Remember, salvation by faith in Christ isn't compatible with the belief that one can lose their salvation. If you believe that your salvation is by faith in Christ, and he says, all that call unto me, all I shall, I shall in no way is cast out, it's not compatible with somebody that can believes they can lose their salvation because you didn't do anything to get saved. You did not work for it. There's nothing you can do to get saved. God says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only way we can be saved is by having someone take the penalty for our sins. And the penalty for sin 
is death. That's eternal separation from God. That's what, what the Lord calls it, separation from God. And that's the penalty for all that have sinned. And you know what? You never have to start off, baby doesn't have to start off lying to, to do the first sin. It's not necessary. Because the baby is born sinner. Uh, so a born sinner. <laughs> What's the greatest uh, commandment? Or what's the, the greatest sin is uh, like the greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. Now, because of sin entering into the world and each person born into the world a sinner, they're born not loving God. They're born sinners. They never have to do another sin. If, if they never did another sin in their whole life, they're still born sinners because they're born not loving God. That's the result of sin entering into the world. I've heard pastors say that babies are born, and after they're born, they start telling lies. They they really want to get uh, some warmth from their mother, or be held, or want them to eat, and so they cry. That's you know that's that may be true. Maybe they do that, but they never had to do that to commit the first sin. They're born sinning, born not loving God. That's the result of sin entering into the world. So the first blank there is salvation by faith in Christ is not compatible. With the belief that one can lose their, their salvation. We believe that salvation is dependent on an individual's own response to God's universal law for salvation. But in addition to that, a lot of folks apply man's reasoning, saying that since salvation, election, hinges on man's response to God's offer, it necessarily follows that one can lose their salvation. Their loser is salvation or election, if you want to call it the way, by later rejecting that offer. Thus, there's no assurance of salvation, of ultimate salvation, with these people that believe you can lose your salvation. If I have to do something or not do something in order to keep from losing my salvation, then it's a faith plus works salvation. And not salvation by faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not, that's not compatible with believing you can lose your salvation. If you yourself has any part in maintaining your salvation, then it's going to be extremely difficult to live with much assurance. You're going to be hoping a lot, but you won't have that assurance 1 John 5.13 says, These things have written unto you that believe in the name of God, that you might not, uh, that you might know that you have eternal life, or that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life. So we learn that the best way to know you're saved is to be sure of your salvation. Be sure you've turned to Christ, you've trusted in Christ for salvation. We learn that you're adopted into the family of God when you trust in Christ. Remember that you are a wanted person. You are a wanted person. God chose to adopt you before the foundation of the world for only one reason. Because he wanted you. I've heard of unwanted pregnancies that result in unwanted children, but I've never heard of an unwanted adoption. God wanted you into his family. He went to great lengths to get you into his family. He became a man, took on the form of a man, went through all that a man had to go through, or a baby has to go through, nine months in his mother's womb, and then go through the birthing process, and then go through childhood, and go through the whole... If, if I was, if was going to... If I was God, I would not choose to do it that way. I'd come down here a full-blown man. I would no way. I would not go through that childhood stuff. I wouldn't go through the birth stuff. I wouldn't go through that first nine months. That is absolutely for sure. But God doesn't do it the easy way. He wanted us, and he did. He did it the whole nine yards. He did it all in order to become a man, in order to have blood to shed, but because that blood is what's required to pay for our sins. He shed his blood on the cross and died a terrible death. Like I say, he doesn't do anything in a little way. He does everything in a big way. And he shed his, his 
His blood for you and me. He wanted you. He wanted you and his family. There's no scriptural support for the concept that God's adoption, the act that of his adoption acts, that it can be reversed. There's no scriptural support for that. Now, I keep drilling these things over and over again. This is about the third or fourth week that I've covered that particular part because I really want you to know and I really want you to understand those things. It, um, and I want to add this evening concerning your eternal salvation. Uh, first thing I want to add is your official forever adoption. Your for official forever adoption. Religious leaders in the first century, the days of the early church, I'm not talking about Christians. I'm talking about the Jews, the Jewish leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the priests in, in the re early religious, uh, the religious leaders in the first century. Uh, they believed that uh, one was righteous by keeping the Mosaic law. They didn't accept Christ. They didn't understand or even comprehend the age of grace. According to the religi religious crowd, the prodigal son was hopelessly, ceremoniously unclean. But we don't see that in the par parable. We don't see how the son lost his place in the family. But the religious crowd, the Jews in that day, believed that you're, you're cast out. You're, you're no longer eligible to be a son. You're no longer eligible. There's not, but in the story of the, of the prodigal son, there's not even the slightest hint of rejection by the father. We don't see the father demanding permission to re enter into the family. The son was just a wandering and wayward son who was immediately accepted back in, into full fellowship with the family when he repented and came back. We don't see any good works maintaining the relationship between the father and the son in the parable. Remember, that's a picture of salvation to our heavenly father, God. The father didn't kick the son out of the family. Our heavenly father doesn't kick us out of his family when, when we do something wrong. He might have to punish us, but he doesn't kick us out. What kind of a loving father would that be? You kick your your child out of the family when they did something wrong. No, that's that's not that's not a picture of God. That's not a picture of the way the Lord does things. Okay, now there's some yellow or some blank spaces there, right? Uh, was hopelessly ceremonially unclean. Did you get that one? Um, the parable how the son lost his place in the family. Did you got that one? Our heavenly Father doesn't kick us out of his family either? What kind of a loving father would be, that be? I think that's caught us up on all the blanks, right? Now what I want to tell you is your eternal salvation is signed, sealed, and delivered. Blank spots. Signed, sealed, and delivered. The moment you received Jesus Christ, you were signed, sealed, and delivered. It was a little while from when, when Jesus Christ arose and people uh, were saved. There was a little a small period of time there uh, till they were sealed. In fact, they were told to stay there in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came down. They weren't to go out. They had to stay there in order to have the power of the Holy Spirit upon them in order to be sealed. They had to be sealed. They had to have that protection. The moment you received Christ, you were signed, sealed, and delivered. Sometimes I have to take some medicine for drainage. I have a lot of sinus problems, a lot. And it goes down the back of my throat. And not too long ago, I woke up in the middle of the night, all clogged up. Well, matter of fact, a lot of not, a lot of not too long ago. A lot, a lot of them. It happens a lot. Um, but I, this particular night... <coughs> I woke up with all this drainage down my throat. And I stumbled out of bed, and I, I turned the light on in the bathroom. And I fumbled around getting the medicine out, the medicine that was individually wrapped and packaged, half asleep, squinting from, from the light. And the, and the marathon began to extricate those two pills out of that packaging. Several minutes later, finally I had the medicine. But you can be sure I was wide awake. 
One thing about it, that medicine was definitely secure in that package. It surely hadn't been tempered with, that's for sure. And those contents were protected and intact. But I'll tell you this. No matter where that container had been or who had handled it, that medicine was secure. On a much more magnificent scale, there's a seal that assures each believer that no one has tampered with their eternal security. There's a blank spot. No one has tampered with their eternal security. Paul said it like this in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. He said, uh, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the world, uh, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye did, believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the, uh, unto the praise of his glory. <coughs> it also tells us in 2 Corinthians that there's also a seal upon us. Blank spot. It tells us in 2 Corinthians that there's a seal upon us. Did anybody miss a blank spot? The first four? Okay, remember, salvation by faith in Christ. I could continue on here. So it also tells us in 2 Corinthians that there's also a seal upon us. Did I read that verse already? No, I did? Okay. Um, there's Seals are used several times in the Bible. Jesus' tomb was marked where it was sealed by the Romans in Matthew uh, 27, 66. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. They had a fire team, a four-man fire team. I forget what they call it, quaternon, that's what they call them. They call them quaternons, the Marine Corps calls them fire team. Okay? They had a four-man fire team, and they set a seal on that thing. And not only was the seal in there, but they were watching it. All the good that that did. So we're told by Satan, a blank space, we're told by Satan, we're excuse me, told that Satan will be sealed in the abyss for a thousand years. Satan will be sealed in the abyss for a thousand years. Revelation 20, 2-3. And he lead hold on the, that dragon, or the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. That's the millennial reign on earth. A thousand years he's in the pit. And shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. So he's sealed in a the pit. There's no way he's getting out. Not for a millennium. Not for the millennial reign on earth. While Christ is reigning on earth, Satan's in the pit. He's sealed and he's, he can't get out. That seal is sure. And that's the same kind of seal that you have. Actually, the seal that you have is even better than that because the seal that you have is the Holy Spirit in you. That Holy Spirit seals you. So in every case, the seal carries with it the idea of protection and security. Now, if those Roman soldiers couldn't break the seal, and if Satan couldn't get out of the seal for a thousand years, and if none of Satan's hordes can get through the seal to 144,000, no, uh, I left the space here. During the tribulation, God's going to place a seal on the 144,000, okay? From the 12 tribes of Israel. And who are those tribes? Reuben, Gad, Judah, Simeon, Benjamin, Dan, Manasseh, Ephraim, Zebulun, Ishtar, Asher, and Naphtali, okay? <clears throat> and the forces of the Antichrist are not going to be able to touch those any of those 144,000 from those 12 tribes. <clears throat> so it's 
the idea of protection and security. Now, if the Roman soldiers couldn't get through the seals, if Satan can't get out of the seal, and if none of Satan's hordes can get to the 144,000 that are sealed, just who, how, or why do we think that uh, that seal that's put on you can be penetrated? Nothing can get through that seal. You are secure. It can't. It can't be broken. It can't be gotten through. Because God's word tells us, ye are sealed until the day of redemption. In Ephesians 4.30. You're sealed until the day of redemption. No, it's not a blank yet. So as I said a little while ago, the moment you receive Christ, you're signed, sealed, and delivered. And nothing can change that. So what's the nature of the seal? Well, in Revelation, the 144,000 are sealed with some kind of physical mark or stamp on their forehead so that none of the Antichrist troops nor the Antichrist himself can harm you. It's a supernatural protection. I said the Antichrist because the, because the Satan himself is bound and in the pit, remember? He's in the pit for a thousand years. But unlike the seal in 144,000, our seal is not physical in our foreheads. Our seal is spiritual. We see that we've been given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit himself dwells in us. And that's a pledge of God's intent to preserve us. God bought you with a price, and he's not about to let you go. Corinthians 1, uh, 21 and 22 says, Now... He which establish you, establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Wow. Who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. If God did it, you can count on it. So the Holy Spirit indwelling is a pledge of God's intentions. He's not finished with us yet. The presence of God's Spirit is a demonstration of God's commitment to, com to complete what he has started in, in Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If salvation isn't really permanent, then God's just playing games. He didn't send his spirit into our heart to play games. Listen, God is not a deceiver. God is not a liar. That's the things that Satan does. You might ask, well, how long am I sealed? Well, the day of redemption refers to the time when our salvation is complete, body and spirit. That's when we, we receive our new bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 15. 33 or 53 says for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality there's no exceptions everyone who has received Jesus Christ will be sealed right up until we are in heaven with him so how can we lose our salvation it would mean we lose the seal who could possibly do that? Can't be done. Jude 24 and 25 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of, of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Wow. That, that pretty much spells it out. Listen, you're saved forever when you trust in Christ because he keeps you saved. He's the one that saved you to begin with and he's got you in the palm of his hand and nothing can take you from the palm of his hand, not even yourself. <clears throat> Romans 8, 31 through 39 says, What shall we say unto these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give you 
to give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather that he's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angel nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So don't, don't have any confidence in anybody that would tell you anything differently. Because they're just not comprehending. They might not even be saved themselves. I'll tell you something. Satan wants to make you think you're lost. He can't, when you're saved, when you've trusted in him, he can't keep you from going to heaven, but he can sure make you lose the joy of your salvation. And if you do that, you'll, you'll not be instrumental in anybody else coming to know the Lord. If I'm looking at some guy and I say, wow, I don't want to have what he has. He's just a down in the mouth all the time. We need to be joyous Christians. We need to have other people seeing Christ in us so that other people wouldn't have what we have. You know, he didn't just leave us here for no reason at all. He could have popped us out of here when we got saved. But he left us here in order to serve him, in order to be instrumental in others coming to know him. For, for those that say salvation is not forever, then that's contrary to the very words of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us that all who trust in him, he gives eternal life. He tells us that, eternal life. Eternal life doesn't start in the future. Eternal life starts the instant you trust in Christ. He covers all your sins with his blood. All your past, present, and your future sins. And remember, all your sins were future when he shed his blood for you. And as I explained the other day, Abraham believed 2,000 years before he shed his blood. He didn't know how, why, or when. He just believed that God was going to do it, and his belief was accounted in him for righteousness. 2,000 years later, then, <coughs> then the Lord did come from heaven, <coughs> took on the form of a man, and shed his blood. And it was another 2,000 years, but Abraham was looking forward to just believe that God would do it. And his belief is accounted to him for righteousness. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we're looking back. We have the benefit of the Bible that tells us how it was done. And what, in the same belief is accounted to us for righteousness. We're saved the same way Abraham was, by belief. It's just um, Christ could have shed his blood a thousand years after, or before, uh, after Abraham. He could have shed his blood a thousand years before Abraham. He could have shed his blood a thousand years yet for us. But it's our belief that applies his blood to our, to our uh, sins. It covers them. And it's our belief that, that saves us. Well, it's our belief that applies his shed blood that saves us, okay? <clears throat> for those people that believe they can lose their salvation, they've got a questionable salvation. They've got no assurance. Therefore, they've got no real joy. Now, let's talk about who will perish. Who's going to perish? There's a blank. That's the first blank since the last blank. Okay? According to those who believe that no one loses their salvation, whatever it is that sends a person to hell can be done over and over repeatedly. There's a couple more blanks. Over and over. <coughs> Eternal damnation is undoubtedly one of the most difficult teachings of the Christian faith. How could God justify punishing a man or a woman eternally for sins committed over a period of a few years? It doesn't seem right, yet the scriptures definitely teach that hell is a real place for real people. Revelation 20, 10 uh, and 15. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are 
and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So both sides, the people that believe you can lose your salvation and the people that uh, uh, think you once saved, you're, you're eternally saved, as the Lord says, um, they agree on two things. They agree that all have sinned. As it says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned. We talked about that. Uh, we were born sinning. We were born not loving God. We were born breaking the greatest commandments. We're born sinners. We never had to commit the first sin because we're born sinners. Yet some of those sinners are going to make it to heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we were at, our, at home in a body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. So some of those sinners... All of sin, but some of those sinners are going to make it to heaven. So then, there's a category of sinners that will escape eternal punishment. There's a blank. There's a category of sinners that will escape eternal punishment. What separates them from the rest? There's another blank. Separates. What separates them from the rest? Uh, is it severity of sin? We've all probably met somebody that that believes their particular sin is too severe for God to forgive. Um, one guy said, I know that God's a forgiving God, but he's not blind. Sure, God can forgive some things, but look what I've done. In some folks' minds, certain sins are so bad that God just can't forgive them. Consequently, those folks that have been involved with those sins are doomed to hell not the case. If that were the case, God would have guided some of the writers to make a list of unpardonable sins. But there's no such thing. Uh, you don't have a list of unpardonable sins. A loving God would not, I'll cover the unpardonable sin. I'll refer to it in a minute. And God would not uh, leave us to guess about such an important thing. He wouldn't he wouldn't leave us to guess. God loves us. God wants you to be confident in your salvation. God wants you to be able to go out of here confident. Not one of, boy, I hope I'm saved. Or, or you go home and on the way home you mess up. You wake up in the morning and say, oh man, I've got to get saved again. That's no way to live. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. He's talking to those folks there in Corinth. And such were some of you. You folks are some nasty people. And such were some of you. But you're washed. But you're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. So, some of those nasty, round people have been saved by the shed blood of Christ. So, certain sins are really bad. But there's none too bad to be saved. No one yet has found sin of sin too severe for God to forgive. Paul himself was guilty of persecuting the church, dragging Christians off to prison, and having some murdered and executed. You remember when Stephen was stoned? Who do you think was standing there holding all the coats? Hey, if I, you know, when they stone somebody, they don't. You're you're about to be stoned. They don't they don't go. You know, they take their coat off. They take like this. So the intention is to mess up your face. The intention is to make you see one eye out of this eye. and one out of this. The intention is to break your teeth. The intention is to kill you. 
They took their coats off. And it was Paul, Saul, if we're going to be saying Paul, he was holding those coats. In fact, I believe that he's the one that instigated uh, that Stephen would be stoned. Paul was instrumental in, in many, Saul was instrumental in many being murdered, being thrown into prison because of Jesus Christ. And yet, Jesus Christ saved him. Hell is not reserved for certain types of sin. Even those who murdered Jesus Christ himself didn't have that sin accounted to them. In Luke 23, you can check it out later, 23, 34. Uh, killing the Son of God wasn't even severe enough to put those men outside of the boundaries of forgiveness. So, how about repetition of sin? But how about the guy who keeps repeating the same sin over and over again? Do you think that even God grows weary and that eventually his patience runs out? Even if he repents of each offense, it soon enough becomes apparent that his repentance is insincere. Luke 17, 3 through 4. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in the day, and seven times in the day, then turn again to thee and saying, I repent. Thou shalt forgive him. Jesus' point here is to continually forgive others, no matter how often they offend us, or how insincere their apology may seem to be. Uh, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If someone ends up in hell after trusting in Christ, doesn't that make what Christ said here to Nicodemus a lie, or best a half-truth? Okay, how about unbelief? What then guarantees the omission of a person's name in the book of life? What guarantees that? I think the clearest teaching is right there in, in, this pa in the passage we just read. Um, we don't see a list of sins to keep from. It doesn't say anything like as long as a man keep from those particular sins, he'll not perish. It doesn't say that. Remember, God's only condition is belief in him. That's the only condition. That's another blank. The only condition is belief in him. John 3.18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So according to God's own word, what a man must do to keep from spending an eternity in hell, all Jesus requires is the individual believe in him. According to God's own word. Now, two other questions here. What's the condemning judgment that Christ is talking about? Hint, it's not the judgment seat of Christ. Nor is it the great white throne judgment. Um, the judgment referring to is the, is the judgment that that's referring to is, is the judgment of the lost after the earth is ended. Some will not be judged. Some have already been judged. Others are, are being judged so what is it? John 3.19 says, And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because the, their deeds were evil. What is it? Well, that by refusing to believe in Jesus Christ, people condemn themselves. Or, or people remain condemned. Remember, they're born condemned. And they're... And they're and once they trust in Christ, once they believe in Christ, their condemnation is lifted. When people turn away from the Savior, they condemn themselves. 
The second question raised by Jesus Christ's conversation with, Nicod with Nicodemus is, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Well, I believe it's, it's going to rain. I believe it's going to rain today. I believe it's going to rain tomorrow. That's a calculated hope. I believe in God. That's a mental uh, assent to an idea. An idea of God. It's a mental assent to that. I believe in God. There's, n there's no sense of trust there. There's no sense of commitment. Just an acceptance of an idea. An acceptance of an idea is not belief in Jesus Christ. I mean, the fallen angels, the demons, they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe he was alive. They know who he was. They saw him for an eternity past. They saw him. But that belief has no trust in it. According to Webster's Dictionary, uh, trust is an assured reliance in a person or a thing. It all comes down to this, folks. A person's salvation and marriage are similar in a lot of ways. One doesn't become married by acting married. My wife and I, honestly, we're really married. We're not just acting that way. We've been married for almost 52 years. It really happened. It's not just a matter of me putting a ring on. He really did did it. He really got married. Uh, one becomes married by getting into a legal contract. Getting divorced is a legal matter as well. There have been a lot of folks who've been separated and acted single. They might have taken the ring off. They have no evidence of being married. But they're still just as married as the day that they said their vows. In like manner, some people don't act like Christians. But that has not changed their legal sonship status, nor their eternal destiny. It's a legal thing. When you trust in Christ, it's fulfilled. The act is done. It's eternal. It doesn't change. There's people that act like they've, they've trusted in Christ, yet they haven't. The act is not complete. The shed blood has not been applied to their sins. Their name is not written in heaven. But the folks that, <coughs> that have done those things they are eternally saved forever. There's nothing that can change it. And that's what I want to bring to you tonight. Listen, I want you to go out of here and I want you to be confident in your eternal salvation. I don't want you to go out in a, in a, in a day or a week or something happens and say, man, I hope I, I hope I didn't lose my salvation. You need to know, you need to have confidence in your salvation because your salvation is not of you. Your salvation is of Jesus Christ. You turn to him and, and call unto him to save you, and he saves you eternally. It doesn't change. Let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I'm pretty confident in my own heart right now that the folks in here have already trusted in you. Maybe there's somebody that hasn't trusted in you. They need to, they need to do it. They need to do it right now if they've never trusted in you. But Lord, the thing is, there's a lot of things that happen from day to day, and Satan is always pinging on us to make us think we've lost our salvation. And Lord, my intention is while I'm here is to bring this confidence in salvation so that people will have, understand that they have eternal security. I want them going out of here happy. I want them going out of here and spending day after day in the joy of their salvation. <clears throat> Bless them, Lord, and give them this confidence and help them out. And I pray that your purpose will be done. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Uh, let us stand just for a moment, and our pianist is going to.
play through a hymn of invitation. And if she's playing, if God's been dealing in your heart, maybe you need to come up here and talk to me. Maybe you need to come down here and kneel at the altar. Maybe you need to take care of something that doesn't even have to do with salvation. Maybe you need to join the church. Maybe you need to be scripturally baptized. Whatever it is that God's dealing in your heart, avail yourself of the opportunity at this time and get it taken care of. Thank you. I want to thank you for being here. I need to talk to y'all for a minute. So go ahead and have a seat. Um, tomorrow is going to be a an interesting day. We have a lot of folks coming come here, I believe. People that I, I'm not real sure that I've ever seen before. I understand that there's folks folks that come to come to church for Thanksgiving uh, for the Thanksgiving meal who only come here once a year for the meal. And I understand that there's folks coming here with Tupperware. To take away food. The only time you see them is that. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give them, get the gospel to them. If, they want, if they're going to come here and they're going to partake of the food, they're going to get the gospel. And I'm going to do a, a short, powerful message. I think I'm going to do it at a, of a Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch probably. But that's not for solid sure. But regardless, I'm going to hit folks square between the eyes with the gospel uh, for a short period of time. And I was thinking about having a, a popcorn preaching. Do you know what that is? Anybody know what popcorn preaching is? You get folks to come up and they get five minutes to bring a message. They can have one point, two points, three points. Ever how much they can do in five minutes. At the end of five minutes, it's cut off. In fact, we did this a lot in in Italy, I had a bunch of uh, preacher boys in there. A bunch of guys. They were from a lot of them were from Ghana and, and Nigeria and places like that. And they're refugees, but they come up here and they'd start preaching and they get uh, fired up or they forget what they were doing and they just go on and on. But I had a guy with a with a cell phone and he had a timer on it, and it would start barking real loud. And so I I say, you got five minutes, go. And he would hit that timer. And in five minutes, if they'd only got one point and part of one point, and the dog starts going, roof, 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 they're done. <laughs> but it, what it does is it teach, teaches people to be concise and get their, their uh, points together real fast. Popcorn preaching. We'd, uh, I'd usually try to get three or four guys, give them five minutes. And so it's done real fast. I was going to do that tomorrow, but I'm not going to do that tomorrow because I want to do a concise message of salvation. I want to make sure that these folks that come in uh, get the gospel. So the way I think that we're going to do it is we're going to eat. We're going to have the, the uh, desserts covered up or, or set in, a, in the kitchen. They're not going to be brought out. They can eat and then then I'm going to get up and, and uh, preach the gospel. And then we'll bring the, the desserts out and people can have the desserts. Does that sound okay with y'all? Okay, now, I mean, we've got a lot of folks that have spent a lot of time and a lot of money on, the, on this, this meal. And people come in here once a year with Tupperware containers to take away our meal. You know, I'm not sure exactly what to do about that. Anybody got a suggestion? No. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. <laughs> but uh, maybe I'll just make an announcement. I'll say, listen, people have spent a lot of time and money in preparing this meal, and 
if there's anything left over, they at least ought to be able to take some of it home. And so I'd appreciate if, if you didn't bring anything in here that, that you wouldn't take anything home, okay? I'll make that an announcement. And if you see somebody that didn't bring something in and is walking out with something, trip them, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, let's, anybody have any questions? Did, did I miss, was I, I was going to say something else. Do we have do we have these welcome packets made up? We've already got them made up because we got the new tracks, uh, the Japanese tracks. Okay. Okay. Do we need to do anything else uh, upstairs or anything before we leave, so we can turn the lights off and DD mail, right?